Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Commander Clash podcast, where the Commander Clash crew discusses commander-related topics, and today we are going to be debating what are the single best cards for every single mana value. We're going to start at mana value zero, and we're going to work our way all the way up to the highest mana value, which I believe is 16 currently. Uh, it may change in the future, but right now that's that's where we got we got it up to. So for every single mana value, each of us are going to go around the table, introduce the card that we think is absolute strongest in Commander, at least at the tables that we're playing at, which is, I would say we're basically like mid-power. So this is not like a CDH scale. Uh, the, the value of these cards may actually change, like which one you would pick at the highest at CDH might be different, but we're talking at mid power, what we consider the most absolute powerful cards at every single mana value. So let's kick things off with mana value zero. Uh, Richard, what is the card that you would consider the absolute best? Uh, mana Crypt. No. <laughs> That's it, it, a- yeah. it adds two colorless, you flip a coin during your upkeep, you lose, you take three damage, zero cost. I mean, um, any any debate yeah. on this? Yeah, it's, no. It's, <laughs> it's got to be Mana Crypt, right? I think you could make an argument yeah. for some lands if you wanted to include lands. Uh, Command Tower, Kaya's Cradle, Field of the Dead. But I, I think, uh, I mean, it's colorless. It goes in every mm-hmm. single deck. Like, outside of budget yeah. concerns, every single deck is going to get better with a Mana Crypt in it. So I think it's yep. it's a pretty clear choice. Yeah, I, I think like the, the first minor spoiler, the first couple drops we're going to be talking about, it's going to be mostly consensus. Mana Crypt, probably the easiest consensus out of all of them. I don't know. I don't even know what else could be even in the running, honestly. Yeah. Even lands, like this one, you can, lands, you, you have to play, you can only play like one land a turn. This one is like, you can just play yeah. this into other <laughs> stuff. It's insanity. Yeah, yeah this Crypt. really puts you ahead. So, I mean, like, no. I, I, I just don't see what else you would do. Right, like th- there's just nothing else you could do at zero. All right, we'll move on to something a little bit more spicy, a little bit more contentious, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> uh, what drops? <laughs> what, what what would we talk about What's uh, in a terms one of one drop? Drops? We would mm. all play. Hmm. Hmm. Seth, what, what would you put uh, on top? <laughs> so 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 my one drop is a uh, is Soul Ring, just one mana artifact, Tabstead, two generic mana. Basically, mana crypt uh, that costs a mana, but you don't lose any life and have to flip any coins. Does anyone disagree with this one? I feel like this is probably another consensus one. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't know anyone though. I, at least I don't think there's many other things that could beat this out. Would one, even right? be uh, up in the running. Yeah. yeah, skull clamp. The only thing. A lot of more elves. Skull uh-huh. clamp. Swords. Skull clamp. Brainstorm. I think Land maybe? of War Elves definitely not just because Land of War Elves only taps for one and it has summoning sickness. And there's like a million but, versions of it. And oh, Mana Vault. Yeah. What about Mana Vault? More upfront mana, but you gotta pay to untap no. it. No. Yeah, the ba- it's that back half that it. makes it a little painful, right? I like, think because Soul Ring is just always tap it, get to. Doesn't matter. Oh no. Oh, I, I'm backtracking us here. I have to. Zero mana, Urza Saga. Is there an argument for Urza Saga since it gets your soul ring and your mana crypt and it's zero mana and it makes constructs and it gets other stuff? Any any argument that that's better than mana crypt? No way. That's like a, that's like a suspend lands. three. Like, uh, suspend three. I would play Saga mana before crypt, though. But it makes it's constructs stronger. and it can get skull clamps. I think there's an argument. I, I was fully set on mana crypt, but I think there's an argument that Urza Saga might be even better. I, I think I would only I, I would I would still choose Mana Crypt right Mana Crypt is uh immediately just two mana it's always better it's free it didn't it, like I don't lose a land at all I don't get it blown up by a random like reclamation sage <laughs> like I, I like you know there's just I don't know <laughs> it totally dies to reclamation sage yeah. <laughs> just yeah. Yeah. oh right right yeah, yeah yeah sorry I do but like but does the thing is get your value, you, totally but it doesn't your value out of it bad. earlier though. It doesn't do. feel as bad, right? It doesn't count as a, a land drop, right? So yeah. you can combo off of this, right? So depending right. on how high power you are, you can flip this off of your deck on a combo turn to get you know, more mana, whereas right. Urza Saga is like the fair person's game. <laughs> right. Urza Saga, hit fair, <laughs> in a sentence, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I hate Urza Saga. I think that card is cracked, but like legitimately, I, there's just no way it's better than Mana Crypt. I think I All think right. the power of being able to play a three drop on turn one 
is kind of kind of in its own stratosphere even even Sol Ring even Sol Ring isn't isn't quite up there unless like I don't know you lose all your flips and then you go to turn 20 or something <laughs> yeah you're, you're probably right I think it's I think it's a little close though yeah all right so we we came we, we covered the the really no-brainer ones kind of or I mean the ones that that have the least amount of contention between them uh Mana Crypt and Sol Ring Mm -hmm. And now we're going to jump into uh, the two drops. Before we do that, we have to do uh, a little shout out. Um, if you are interested in supporting this channel, you can do this two different ways. Uh, two drops, two different ways. Yeah, see? Mm -hmm. um, so the first way, number one, <laughs> I'm proud of myself on that one. Please like and subscribe, which was the first way you could help out the channel. Like and subscribe. <laughs> And the second okay. way you could do it is you could buy the merch at our merch store, mtggoldfishmerch.com. You can buy the beautiful play, uh, beautiful play mats uh, over stapled on Richard's wall. You can buy deck boxes, deck sleeves, tokens, uh, t-shirts, and so much more over at MTG Goldfish, uh, all over at mtgmerch.com, mtggoldfishmerch.com. Nailed it. It's, yeah, nailed it. Perfect. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so there. Now, now we got that stuff out of the way. We're going to go to the two drops. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Richard. Uh, uh, what would you what would you say is is top for a two drop in? Canada? All right, I don't know why I'm going again, but uh, Dockside. <laughs> I think Dockside Extortionist two mana one two Goblin Pirate when it enters the battlefield create X treasure tokens or X is the number of artifacts and enchantments your opponent controls. I'm just going to point out there that this gets stronger the higher up the power level you're playing. Right, because people will be playing mana crypts, soul rings, uh, like mox amber, like stuff like that. So it yeah. actually gets supercharged, and then you can also like underworld breach this back. You can blink it. Like you, you basically can combo with this to not only get the one shot in mana, mm -hmm. and then also when your opponents dock side and they don't go off, you dock side and like basically double up. Right, you get treasures for each of their treasures well they uh, they have to like sacrifice their yeah. treasures to, to even stop won't. you which is still like a win right yeah. yeah so i think it's pretty unanimous we have dock side across the board for everyone anymore anymore I, I put it I, I only mentioned i wanted you to bring it up because you put dowsing dagger also in in, in the semicolon I was a, like, okay in okay i'll explain this. why so this one this one was the first thought provoking one because if yeah. you are not playing a combo deck and you're not playing high powered. I think Dockside is actually overplayed and pretty weak. That if you flip a dagger, that's three additional mana every turn for the rest of the game from turn three. Uh, so like if you Dockside on turn two at a medium power table, nothing's happening, right? It's actually a late game burst, and that burst is like a mana geyser, and you need to win the game, right? So mm -hmm. I actually think if you were like I would actually play. Doc, uh, dousing Dagger over Dockside in most of my decks because I play dirtily low power decks and I think it's a stronger card. I really? was not expecting anyone <laughs> yeah. to argue Dousing Dagger would be better than Dockside. I was, yeah, um, I was no, not I'm not saying it's thought. better. I'm just saying like the lower <laughs> power curve, the worse <laughs> Dockside gets. And I think Dagger is actually stronger at the lower power. But like at a high power table, Dockside for combo potential is a lot higher. Oh, wow. This is a I, spicier take than anything on Hot Ones. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you realize how absurd Dousing Dagger is? It's three mana, but every turn now, right? You're plus uh, three every turn. But you do have to jump through a few hoops. Yeah. Like, Dark Side, you just kind of play and you get all the mana. Like, you're playing Fledgling Offsprees and Cartographer's Hawks to try to make your Dousing Dagger, like, turn into that. Like, Dark Side doesn't have any of those, like, hoops to jump through. So it's like, hey, you play this and, like, I do crazy things and then maybe you also combo with me. So, ah, uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know about this I argument. Think that, <laughs> that that even even at a medium power table, even at, like there's still always something to do. So I I, I don't know. Like I mean, the, people still play like signets, still play all of that. So why wouldn't you? I you know what I mean. Like well, I I think it always does something. I think I think Richard is definitely correct that uh, Dockside is more powerful at higher power tables. Sure. Because yeah. the odds of like somebody being like crypt soaring, you know, mocks and all that stuff, the odds of a dockside being good on like even turn one. Let's say you're you're playing your fourth you're the fourth spot. The odds of like a turn one dockside being like 
you know, generating five or so treasures, it's pretty high at a CDH table. Whereas, you know, a mid power table, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer for Dockside to be good. But I feel like around turn five ish, you know, the, there's going to be just a bunch of mana rocks on the table, some enchantments on the table, and you're going to have decent value. And yeah, the amount of hoops, hoofs, the amount of hoops, not hoofs. We're, we're going to come to <laughs> the that. A lot of crater hoops later. you need to jump through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of crater hoops. <laughs> like, you play it on turn five, you generate like eight, eight mana or something like that. You're going to play a big spell, and then, you know, maybe you blink it, you sun tighten it or something later. It's so much value, and it's so immediate. Like, the, how do people uh answer it you have to counter it right like that's it you can't even kill it whereas a dowsing dagger it's a five mana investment total you have to have a creature you have to attack with the creature then you flip it then basically you need to tap that land that three mana land two times to start netting mana and then from there on it's 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 gravy value but like that's gravy that's still a while value. that's like that's like you need to still wait like five mana investments have to hit a person then you need to wait in another turn cycle of tapping it to start you know being above and then whereas oxide is like you play it two mana don't care about the whatever you don't have to do anything else and then you're up like five mana or whatever and then hooray <laughs> you also uh-huh. have the chance of forcing uh like you know like somebody that is like like loaded with treasures to actually pop their treasure well, I don't think that Dowsing Dagger is actually in the running for best two drop. I did actually find this to be a pretty hard mana value because I think there are some other cards that are like pretty close. Cyclonic Rift is a big one that I think is like absolutely mm. busted and is on yep. the dock side level. Demonic Tutor it's probably not deserves side level. a shout it's out. Oh, I think is it not like uh, no? I think these are the cards you 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 want dock side like demonic tutor is like I'm tutoring for my dock side. Mana, <laughs> mana drain, mana drain's like dock side, mm-hmm. but it counters the spell. Isn't that even better? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, no. Because you need uh, your opponent to pop, like if you manage it in turn two, that's just plus two mana, right? Right. Yeah, that's, you need and, your opponent and to you really you, pop you, it off. You, you avoid casting a two drop on, well, I mean, Dockside, you're usually mid-power table, you're not playing it on turn two either, but... I mean, like, I think have so to, like, Dockside commit. is unique. So like Demonic Tutor, you have Vampiric Tutor, you have Scheming Symmetry, you have the thing that buys back three mana, the five mana buy back three. Rift... I mean, there's cap size and things like that, but like, there's only one Dockside, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I and mean, I do I... love Dockside. I'm on Team Dockside. Like, Vesuva, you know, <laughs> good card of Thespian State. I love that stuff, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm on that team. I'm surprised yeah. no one chose Rift. Maybe? I, 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 I really Rift agonized. Lovers. I really agonized on it, but I, I think Dockside, as you said, it's unique and... Rift doesn't win you the game. Dockside can no. win you the game. And it's like kind of surprised, uh, surprised me how many decks I've played with Dockside where it kind of accidentally wins me the game. Like I don't even try to build around it. And it's just like, oh, I played this and then I can have it die and get it back with Eternal Witness. And next thing you know, I have like 50 treasures and I'm like, oh, I guess I just like accidentally won. Cyclonic Rift <laughs> doesn't do that. I think it's close, but I think Dockside is, like you said, it's unique. It does something no other two drop does. I, Do you I consider often, Rift a two drop though? Sorry, uh, Grim, go ahead. I often don't like think that many things need to be banned <laughs> in Commander. Like, and I think that Dockside is the clear, just front running card of something that needs to be banned. I think that it is so good. It is. It's leagues ahead of a Cyclonic Rift. The next two drop after this, I feel like in Power Gap is so far away. Just because it's always good. It's always good. It always does something. It's always it, it, it just accelerating on resources. It's easy. It's got, like, you can reoccur it. Uh, it also gets, a, like, it, it works with every reanimation spell, right? With, like, even the cheeky ones, right? Like, Unearth and stuff like that. So, like, it's just, it's always there. And it, it, it just, it's so good. It's just so good. It's cheap. It, 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 it you know, randomly, you know, why not have a body on top of it? And you may think, like, oh, well, it's just a 1-1 one, one who cares but like that actually can do something for like a one two whatever (laughs) it has power it does things it It does things i hate that but yeah more importantly it is just it's a disgusting card it does everything that you want to do like and it's only two mana it's only two mana 
I'm I'm on team not nerf it actually, because I want to unban or sorry I want I, I'm team not not ban it because I want everything to be unbanned now. That's where I'm at on the headspace. Apparently, rule zero just takes care of every single situation. So, like, why not unban you know everything and let rule zero sort it out? Why don't why not have black lotuses in the format? We need, we just need anti cards, and then I'll be happy when I when I can steal cards from my opponent's decks. Then then we're good. I mean, if you don't want it stolen, you could just concede. Like, yeah, that's, yeah you got a oh, choice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> played around it. All right. Uh, my 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 uh, my other question with Rift was: Do you consider it a two drop or a seven drop? Because I was I, mean, I I didn't know where to slot it personally because I almost over overloaded it, but it is a two mana value card. I think it's literally two mana value. So technically, mm. techni technically, it's a two drop, and uh, that I'm is the best kind of. I'm gonna call it a two drop because it gets around Gaddick Teague. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and. <laughs> And how much okay. more powerful is it because it's two mana? Like, I've definitely seen Psychonic yeah. Rift's cast just to bounce something for two mana. Like, that does happen sometimes. If it was just yeah. seven mana do that, I think it would be, like, meaningfully less powerful. Right. I think the card's almost almost fine. It just should exile when it when it's resolved. I feel like that would have taken out so much of the field ads. But and, and Dockside should, Dockside or Dockside should say, <laughs> say like, when no, no, cast. No, no. I, I'm pretty sure. If Dockside was cast, it would be maybe be okay. Dockside should be like five mana, like a mana geyser person. Okay, what know. do you think if Dockside could not be blinked or reanimated? Like, yeah, what do you think it, it was a sorcery that exiled itself? Would it be good? Still too good of a ritual, I think. Uh, it would still be good, but it would be way less good. It wouldn't yeah. be our num my number one two drop, I don't think. Well, t we can all agree the dock side is busted. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's so busted that we don't even really consider rift in the in the in the running. That's how busted it is. All right, so we'll move on to three drops. Uh, now things start getting a little bit more interesting. Now that we've moved to the sweet spot of like three to like you know three to seven is where it's going to get really really crazy. So for three. Uh, Krim, what is what is your your most this uh, high picked? So for me at three, this was a a bit of a pickle because it's both Ristic Study and Teferi's Protection for me. Uh, but like <laughs> like these are both very good cards and cards that I almost play automatically in any of the colors that you like you know that that can play them right. They're just such powerful effects. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I, if I had to choose one, I think, well, I don't know. I think Teferi's Protection might actually beat out Ristic for me. Only because Ristic sits on the board and oftentimes people can just answer it pretty easily. Teferi's Protection, you have to counter it or discard it from my hand, right? Otherwise, and like, and sometimes all I need is that, that one turn off to survive and then that's it. And then win the game. So. Mm. All right, this Seth, one's so what you, hard. Yeah. This one's so hard. I saw there was like some last minute uh, edits I keep there. Huh? I keep changing it. So do you okay, want, do you want a second? Or wait, wait, it's changed no, again, huh? No. We okay, just think. Yeah, we'll okay. Talk. I, I I've been agonizing over this for like a week since we decided this was going to be our topic. There's so many good options. Now the time has come where I got to pick one, and I'm going with Eternal Witness. Uh, Eternal what? Witness. What? Eternal what? Witness. <laughs> oh, uh, 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 okay, Eternal, hear me, hear me out, hear me out. Eternal Man. Witness, I play in literally every deck. If I if I have green mana in my deck, it is showing up in my deck every single time. It can be blanked. It does those Dockside Extortionist shenanigans where you can do so. Yeah, you're not gonna like make a million mana, but you still have those same synergies where you can blink it, and it right. gets back the best card in your deck. So if your whatever card you name, Mana Crypt, Soul Ring, Dockside goes to the graveyard, guess what card is gonna let you reuse that card a second time? That is Eternal Witness. I know there's a bunch of other possibilities. I considered all of them, but I I'm sticking with sticking with the old standby Eternal Witness. Is this how you feel I talk about secret rendezvous? <laughs> so wrong, Seth. You don't like you like, don't like Eternal Witness? Okay, oh, but no. wait, wait, wait. You you have Balagan Recovery if you cared about yeah. this, which is MDFC land. Mm. Yep. You, you can't blink, but it's a land. Mm -hmm. You right. have Skullwinder. Mm -hmm. You also right. have regrowth at two. Like, are we really choosing Ewit here? <laughs> I, to be to be fair to Seth, I consider uh, the fact that it's on a creature is really big because we have noticed the most obnoxious use 
of Eternal Witness is absolutely bouncing it to hand, right. repeating it, doing it over and over. Like the worst thing in the world is having like an evacuation of Eternal Witness yeah. on the battlefield. Like that is that's the that best is, thing like, the, the best thing in the world. <laughs> okay, okay. I don't agree that it's the best three drop, but I will give it that that it's better than like a regrowth effect. Okay. What about Skullwinder though? Oh, uh, the Skullwinder is whole... Skullwinder is no <laughs> Skullwinder is better it's so than the Turtle uh, What do you mean? Oh, no. It's no, so good. No, 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 no. I'm with Richard no. on this one. What? Skullwinder okay. has my okay, heart. Now, what now do you we're mean? getting weird. All right, hold on. <laughs> oh, all right, hold hey, on. I, Seth, 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 Seth has, uh, has, okay, has you, uh, you, you here. here. You talked yeah, me. You talk, okay, you, t you talked me out of it, so I'm going to switch it up. Clearly the best three drop. If it's not Eternal Witness, and I, I know, I know. Uh, it's got to be Wheel of Fortune then. Like if no! I, yeah, no, it draws seven cards for it draws three. your opponent's twenty one. Oh no, ah! oh, that, that doesn't that doesn't matter. Think of Secret Rendezvous. That's a Commander All Star, and that draws no! your opponent's cards. <laughs> we, no! Wheel of Fortune refills your hand. It fills your graveyard. It combos with annoying things like Narset and Notion Thief. It's it's the best red card in Commander, and by association, <laughs> the best three drop. In the format, uh, well, best red card outside of Dockside Extortionist. So, <laughs> how about that? Can I have that as the best three drop? Is that acceptable, rest of the table? Maybe in 2010. I, and even then, in Mono Red, Mono Red 2010, <laughs> if that was that, what we're talking about, even then, I would, I would have questions. I might say that it could be better than Eternal <laughs> Witness. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! <laughs> but but there's I, no I would way. say it's not better than Eternal Witness. I would rate Eternal Witness higher. Okay, yeah, I mean that's totally fair. I, I think that's also a fair assessment because yeah, that. <laughs> but the, neither of those cards I think would be more powerful than Teferi's Protection or Ristic Study. Those two okay. are like just haymakers, right? I'll just go with Teferi's Maybe Protection then. Was ban wasn't I'll just, banned. I'll, I'll just go with Teferi's Protection. That's fine. <laughs> they all don't like yes, this yes, place. You, 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 the 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 <laughs> you bullied me out of my love of Eternal Witness. <laughs> I'm Wheel sorry. Is Wheel even good? It, <laughs> I, I feel we don't like Wheel of Fortune anymore. Like, let alone be the top <laughs> card. I, I think still, it's because there's so I many effects like it. like it, right? You have so many other effects that can do something similar, so you just probably don't care enough. And because it, it is expensive, but as a card, it's, it's twenty one cards for the table though, and like you can't even like high power deck like so. The the, the most ideal scenario is <laughs> you like play a bunch of mana rocks, play a bunch of dock sides, wheel into a new hand, and then try to like finish the game while everyone you know went up one card or something. You went up seven, but yep. I feel it's so hard. And at high power tables, like you're just wheeling them into like more forces and. You know, fierce guardianships and things like that, and like twenty-one of them uh, <laughs> opposed to your seven to stop your plans. So I feel you don't really want to wheel, Isn't and more most of like the time it like works out worse for you, and everyone else is happy. It's super rendezvous, right? Isn't that what this is called? Yeah, super, this is this is the same reason why I don't like secret Ra rendezvous. rendezvous <laughs> you only giving up three cards, so the equivalent would be giving one opponent seven, but like it's three to the weakest opponent. Here, you're giving seven to everyone, including the strongest people that can use it the best, right? Like that's well, your deck needs to be significantly better at using these cards than everyone else, which is very hard to do. Wheel nets you seven and nets your opponents twenty one. The well, I mean, they have to Maybe. discard, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the best use for it is to like empty your hand of the mana crypts, the soul rings, the dock sides, refill your hand, cast your eternal witness, get it back, dump your hand again, <laughs> do it again. Like uh, that's something that Wheel of Fortune does that nothing <laughs> else does. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And then grape shot or whatever. So, but okay, Tefer I'll, I'll settle on Teferi's protection. That's fine. That's fine. I'll I'll come into the fold. <laughs> we right, believe you, Tomer. You have a new contender to this to this right. battle. Please don't I, say I'm it's actually, wonder. I'm Skullwinder. shocked. I'm shocked that Teferi's Protection is the one that everybody's selling on because to me, like, Rhystic Study does not even come close. I will, again, bring up the, the study that we had uh, on our stats episode from last season of Commander Clash where Rhystic Study, a turn, a turn four Rhystic Study drew uh, 12 cards on average a turn two Rhystic Study drew nine cards on average. A turn seven Rhystic Study. So this is like near the end of a game. Still drew 11 cards. So on average, a Rhystic, if you play Rhystic Study, Rhystic Study essentially reads 
pay three mana, draw ten cards, and also, and also, your opponents are paying extra for their spells. I'm not. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm insane. not paying any extra. I mean, it's that's really... a wheel of fortune where you draw seven and everyone else does nothing versus uh, you draw you get seven, a... opponents draw 21. This you get them right away with wheel of fortune, though. That is, that is a that's upside. True. That is true. I agree that Teferi's Protection is very good, and it can like it turns board wipes into all upside for you. It can save you. It will say it's super clutch. It's incredibly clutch. Uh but Rhystic Study, like, the, the power of just being able to just jam Rhystic Study, regardless of what's going on on the board state or anything, and just be like, I guess I'm going to draw 10 cards and I'm going to slow you in the process. To various perspective, you have to wait for a certain scenario to happen before you get the value. And the value is really high. The value can be higher than Rhystic Study, but Rhystic Study is just, you jam it, it doesn't matter, there's no hoops. You know, you no hoops to jump through. You just put it on the board. Draw, but draw your ten. You know. Here's the question: Do you win when you play Rhystic Study, or yeah. do you draw seven <laughs> and everyone just clobbers you to death because you spent three mana drawing seven cards? Everyone else deployed threats and like murdered you, or they disenchanted it. I I feel to Ferris protection. The upside is humongous, right? You someone rats you to Ferris Pro. You save like five cards. That's draw five plus all the mana to deploy those cards. Right? right, so you're getting all that mana back plus all the ETBs, and oh, you don't get ETBs, right? So that's saving your board, and that's also the the case where you save your face. Someone wins the game. Like, what is saving the game worth to you? Right? They try oh. to combo off. You phase out. You you fade a combat. Mm-hmm. But the Rhystic Study is drawing you into your Fierce Guardianship. It's drawing you into your Force of Will. It's drawing you into the, the, the protection you need to live. It's also making sure you hit all your lane drops. It's making sure you find all your, your ramp, including your Mana Crypt and your Sol Ring, if you haven't even seen it yet. So I feel like it just it it's, it just turbos you ahead of the table. And you're in blue, so you have the best answers to your table if the table does want to gang up on you. But... What if you play with a, a play group that is responsible and good at magic rather than with me <laughs> who refuses to pay? But like, do you think that we overrate Rhystic Study because of how the dynamics of our group play I out? I think or? most people play like us. Okay. But they shouldn't. It's also, it's also would, you, <laughs> yeah. would you consider Sphere Resistance that doesn't affect you a good magic card? It's affecting I, three players uh, and the, the, you're not being affected whatsoever. I don't think I'd put that in a... Uh, a generic deck. I wouldn't likely. because it would it would probably just pun- get me punched in the face too much. But one exactly that, right? that, that draws problem, me right? cards. <laughs> but this it would card, annoy this people. Draws us cards. Like we know from a fact. Like people aren't going to just always pay the one. They're just not. I mean, like it's, right. it, it is very strong. We're not saying it's not strong. Yeah, but like. Drawing cards efficiently. There's lots of cards that do that. But how many cards <sighs> do a Teferi protection? Right. None. And exactly. Right. That's that's like. I'd cast a secret rendezvous. I know you guys don't like it. What if you cast a painful <laughs> truth? That's like almost a Rhystic Study. Like half of a Rhystic Study or something, right? But there's no half of a Teferi's Protection. Right. I mean, I mean Teferi's mean, Protection is just so unique, right? It does something that literally no other card does. It saves you from combos. It saves your board from rest. Like, if you look at two mana value cards, Heroic Intervention is like a top 10 card. And that is like an incredibly horrible, way worse version of uh, of Teferi's Protection. Teferi's Protection is just so juiced that I think that that has to, that has to count for something. All right. So here here is the the, the, the trial then. You're in an Azorius deck, and you can only have one of these cards in your Azorius deck. Which one do you put in? I put in Teferi's Both. Protection, and then I play some of the million... Secret Rendezvous. I play some of the million other put, ways to draw cards. You can one of these. But there's no one of these. That's a stipulation, the deck building restriction. So Teferi's Both. Protection. Right, Literally I no put in Teferi's Protection. <laughs> well, here's, here, here it is. Like, put in Teferi's Protection, and then I can play other card draw. Or I put in Rhystic Study, but there's no other Teferi's protection. Mm. So I think that that means Teferi's protection has to win just because it's yeah. less replaceable. So, so the there are some effect. Teferi protection like thing, like Cosmic Intervention, Angel's Grace. There are Our some like will. half- Angel's Grace? They're like half- Prevents, you, really prevents someone from winning oh, the game oh, or you oh, die. Oh, right? yeah, 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 yeah. So there okay. are some kind of like fake Teferi's protections that you those, can play. Those, those aren't even half. That, that's like a quarter of a Teferi's protection. <laughs> that's like Teferi. Like that, that, that's not even his protection. That's not even close. 
Because, because like, yeah, like this saves your permanence, right? This saves you, your permanence and everything. So I don't know. And it's so cheap. I mean, I, I like, do understand like Tomer's argument. In your opening hand, you want the Ristic study, and that Ristic study could draw you into the fairy's protection, right? <laughs> like, it could be anything. It could be a boat, right? So I, I get that, right? It's also like you have to have three mana up for this blowout, right? Like, you can't just be like, you know, oh, this is gonna save, this will save my life. This will save me the game, but I don't have the mana up. Oh, GG. But this one is Ristic study. You just, you just jam it. You just you just go for it, and it's like whenever. You just... Ristic study is certainly strong. It, it is a really... It, it's probably the best card draw spell, but... I see the <sighs> argument for... I, it's, Teferi's Protection would be my second as well, but... I mean, we're pretty close, I guess. We, not, these are, like, our top Not teams. Eternal Witness. <laughs> not Ewit. <you> <laughs> not Wheel of... Still Fortune. not Eternal Witness. <laughs> Ewit can get back your Ristic study after he gets blown up. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. All right. That's it's legit to me. All right. Uh, we'll move on to mana value four... And this one has mostly consensus here as well. I'm just going to say the one that I picked. Uh, this is the one that most people picked. It's Smothering Time. It's four mana white enchantment. Uh, it says whenever an opponent would draw a card, they have to pay either two mana or you get to make a treasure. So, I mean, it counts even the, the first card they draw each turn. So you're making per turn cycle, if you have three opponents, you're going to be making three treasures if nobody pays for it. And I think... The fact that it's two instead of one makes it very difficult for even people who want to pay for it uh, to actually do so. You have to be in a situation where either you know you're not going to be uh, cast, like, you know, doing anything with that mana on that turn, or you're so ahead in mana that paying two is not really not really a thing anymore. But we also know from personal experience that you usually make more than three mana per turn cycle as well because people like drawing cards. Uh, so I, I think this card is kind of bonkers, and it's kind of crazy that uh, white has one of the best ramp cards in the format of all things. We all say, like, oh, white is so bad at XYZ, but, like, one of the best ramp cards is white. I so. mean, the problem, though, with Smothering Tithe is it is a white card. So you know when I play it in white decks, there <laughs> is really good colorless ramp that costs four mana. Like, that's... What? So I think you could... I don't know. As far as, like, decks overall, like, sure, in a white deck, Smothering Tithe absolutely busted insane. But what if you're not in white? You might want a card like Hedron Archive, I think should be in the... Oh, I'm not saying it's better than Smothering Tide, but it should at least be in the conversation because because it's colorless and you played it in more I decks. was so close to giving you like, oh, this is a legitimate a legitimate argument until you just, you just, you just have to put that knife in me, Seth. You have to put that knife. Do I have to make another video on Hedron Archive? Is this what he wants? I, this is what I agree wants? with Seth. I agree with Seth. I thought... Ah. Okay, so I have Smothering Tithe number one, okay? But it's not as clear a cut. I think... Okay. So Smothering Tithe is ramp, right? And you get plus three mana every turn if it survives, right? You can... There's some special aspects. You can bank it up, right? Like they're treasures, so you can bank up for another turn. Uh, or if someone draws cards, you get more. But... There's an argument, I think, for Solemn and Sky Shroud Claim. So Sky Shroud Claim is four mana green ramp that gets you two forests. You're, you're netting two mana that's permanent forever. And I think it's very strong. Same with Solemn, that's colorless ramp. Uh, so if you're a non-green creature or non-green deck, you get plus one mana every turn, plus a card on the way out and a body. Or even Seth Siege and Archive, right? Like that plus two mana is every a turn, thing, right? <laughs> like... And it cycles later. Like, I, I think, you know, Smothering Tithe is the best, but there are some close ones coming in here that give you almost as much mana, but, like, more permanence. Like, you know, like, they, people probably won't remove your Hedron Archive, but they'll probably remove your Smothering Tithe, right? Or people might actually pay mana if it's late game, and your Smothering Tithe might do nothing, whereas your Hedron Archive draws cards, still provides mana, etc. So I, I think I there's something believe. to be said about other mana sources at four. <laughs> I can't believe in the best cards by Mana Value podcast, you made me, as the editor, put up Hedron Archive on the screen. That, that, that's a troll title. post. That's Thanks. a troll post. <laughs> Thanks for what you've done. I There's no way. I gotta I gotta ask about one other four drop. I also had Smothering Tithe number one overall, but I do agree with Richard. What about Toski? I know, you, Richard, you've played a lot of Toski's. Is it in the running at all, or is it in like the next tier down as far as four four mana cards? It's very strong, but I wouldn't call it like one of the strongest cards at four. 
Uh, yeah. Like there are, there are lots of cards that do its effect maybe for one more mana, one less, but you know, you need creatures. Um, you know, he can't block. It's a meme. Like you can block the first turn, but like, I, I don't know. It, it's strong, but I would take a smothering tithe over Hosky probably. I would take a lot of cards. I'd probably just take ramp over. Like I don't, I don't, Tomer might be an interesting one to ask because he likes card draw, but I value ramp like way more than card draw. So like any ramp effect, like I would take Kodama over a Toski. Um, but Toski is very strong. Well, we didn't hear from Krim yet. But- I mean, well, like, yeah, like I, I, I'm choosing Smothering Tithe, right? Like it took me a while to like, to like go with Smothering Tithe. And like, I actually thought about it too when you brought up Toski. Like Toski kind of makes a lot of sense why you'd want to mention it and whatnot. But like, Wow, Smothering Tithe is good. Smothering Tithe is very good. So, uh, like, I, I think that Toski is definitely, like, a, a, a feat, like, just the next step down. Uh, it, it's still very powerful, but, like, it, come on, it's, it's Smothering Tithe, right? Like, Smothering Tithe. That's all I have to say. It's Smothering Tithe. <laughs> very per- per- uh, persuasive there. I, I think it would be really interesting to see. Like, since we, we did track Esper Sentinel and Rhystic Study, how many cards we drew, it would be interesting to see how much mana Smothering Tide makes in a game as well. Because, like, yeah, like, it can make three per turn cycle in a four-player game, but I think it makes a lot more than that on average because people are just drawing cards naturally. And if you're drawing cards and you want to cast the cards you drew, you don't want to have that two mana attacks on every single card. So I think it, it starts adding up very quickly. And the fact that you can bank it up like, you can bank it up for a big turn later on as a treasure and, I mean, artifact synergies and all that stuff. But, like, in just a, a generic deck, like, is it going to make three mana per turn cycle or is it going to make more than that? And I think it's going to make more than that. No one ever I mean, pays you know. for it. Yeah, it's you, two You definitely not pay for it on the early yeah. turns. And I don't yeah. think it's correct to even pay for it on the early turns. But I think it's correct yeah. to pay for Rhystic Study and beat them down. Which I don't know that you want to all just pay two mana and, like, do nothing. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like Toski, but like Toski versus like a coastal piracy effect, like they're they're close enough. The yeah, coastal piracy is an indestructible right? or can't be you countered. Four mana. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Toski's the best at its doing of what it's doing, but it is replaceable. I think. Yeah, all right. That's a good argument. All right, we'll move on to five drops, and now things get a little bit dicey. Uh... I want to hear Krim, actually, because I see I see a, a note that I don't even understand. Yeah. <laughs> What's your top five drop? Okay, so I'll explain the note. All right, it's Nico Bolas, Dragon God, into Force of Will. So Nico Bolas <laughs> is Bolas going to do. I don't even know. Nico Bolas, Dragon God, what he does is he pitches himself to Force of Will. Okay, so oh. it is a blue card. <laughs> I was like, "What's going on here?" <laughs> and uh, but also so yeah like my real five drop pick is force of will right like the, i don't i don't know what's beating a force of will here so so like like i can tell you safely that yes it is force of will all the way through i mean it's a free counter spell right it, it's it's just it's always good i just don't see a world where i don't want a force of will uh, being able to like tap out and still like enable your game plan of playing your commander or or whatever or or knowing that you can push your combo and that it's protected feels amazing so i think that there's just no way you're getting around that it's it's funny because i i'm also team force of will and I, I the only reason why i want to explain it is if you asked me like 10 years ago if force of will was the best five drop i'd be like absolutely not i would never play force of will but like the speed at which even mid power games like us uh have accelerated uh you, force of will gets more and more important just like you know it would be in like legacy and vintage i would assume and also the amount of card draw that is readily available to all decks has gone up so much that the downside of pitching another blue card has gone down as well 10 years ago i would be like no like i i spent four mana to draw three cards with my harmonize like there's no way i have i have i'm gonna be going down two cards to ca- to counter a spell but when you have like you know Toskies and whatnot, and everybody's drawing eight super easily all the time, and all your commanders draw cards too. The downside becomes more uh, negligible, I think. So this card is kind of insane to me. Yeah, but that's only me and Krim, uh, Richard, and Seth. You picked doubling season, and I want to hear. I want to hear why. So doubling season, ah, 
Force of Will is really good at stopping broken things, but in Commander, if I had to make a choice, I'd rather just do something broken and win the game. Stopping broken things is definitely beneficial, but why not just win the game? And doubling season, I think, is sneakily, like, incredibly broken, and it should be even more broken in Commander, but people don't play it as much as they should, probably because it's expensive and all this stuff. But doubling season into so many different Planeswalkers is essentially Splinter Twin win the game. Like, you ultimate the Planeswalker immediately, and you really do just win the game on the spot. Plus, you got plus one, plus one counter synergies. Plus, you got token synergies, which are massively powered up by having a doubling season on the battlefield. And it's a pretty unique effect, too. There's a couple of, like, sort of similar cards where you get part of it, like uh, an anointed, uh, anointed Procession, or I think there's a Commander version, Primal Vigor, but that impacts yeah. all your opponents, and I <laughs> I think it's only yeah. plus one plus one counters so it doesn't work with planeswalkers <laughs> nothing does everything of what doubling season does so i'm gonna go with a broken card over the stop a broken thing card but what do you think richard surprise you guys chose force like so when i think commander the first card i think of is soul ring and then the second card is doubling season like this is what people do in commander you you double the things you double everything right the tokens the counters the the planeswalker loyalty it's really strong. You see a doubling season, you're going to die if they untap with it, right? And maybe you don't even have a chance to interact because they doubling season into Planeswalker and you're dead. So I'm more team proactive. I think this is actually the poster child of Commander. And I think Force of Will is okay. Like in higher power tables, it gets more relevant. Uh, but there are alternate things, right? There's like uh, Fierce Guardianship, uh, you know, like a swan song, like, yes, one man is not free, but one man is pretty good, right? right so there, right. there are other things you can do. And yeah, I, I don't know that we want to be reactive here. Uh, I think I'd rather just be proactive with the doubling season. I think you already know that I am all about reactive, <laughs> that I am proactive. <laughs> so naturally, I, the counter spell, yeah, hell, oh, hell yeah. Yeah, that's the one. The free one, oh, yeah. Is there an argument for Fierce Guardianship at three if you guys like Force of Will at five? I love Force because at five, I think it, it's a clear cut for me, at least in like the way I play. It makes more sense uh, that that Force is great. But at three, there's like there's just no denying that Teferi's protection and and like like as again the the gap between like Teferi's protection, Ristic Study, and anything else is so wild. Yeah, and, I, I think Fierce is one of the best, but over Ristic Study, I, there's no way. Yeah, and Ristic Fierce Guardianship is like. A lot worse than force. It only gets non creatures. You gotta have your commander to cast right, it for free. Right. Right. So I think there's like a few reasons why it's not quite force it will good. You don't have to pitch a blue card though. That's kind of big. That is true. So. And I do agree with you, Tomer, that force keeps going up in value. Like the more busted like look at the first part of our list with dock sides and with Ristic studies and smothering tides and doubling seasons. Uh, Wizards keeps putting more and more busted cards. So having cards like Force of Will, I do, I do think is more important today than it was a couple of years ago. But I'd still rather doubling season Planeswalker and just win. <laughs> I'm, I'm so close between between the two. Like I think doubling season, I, I totally agree. Where like if you play doubling season, generally speaking, you either win immediately afterwards because you like get like a Planeswalker ultimate that just can't be interacted with and just wins you the game, like the Tamio ultimate, for example. Or you pass a turn, and then your next turn is going to win you the game. Like, it, it definitely is, like, if somebody puts a doubling season on the battlefield, like, the number the number of things, like, the, the highest threat level permanence that you could put on the, uh, the battlefield at any given time that makes everybody, like, be like, oh, no. Uh, doubling season's definitely up there. But I don't know. Maybe it's because I haven't personally been on the receiving end of doubling season that much. Because, like, usually when I see it, it usually just gets blown up because everybody knows <laughs> it's, like, has to be blown up. So yeah, maybe yeah. it's maybe because I don't see it resolve and actually do the thing that I, I, I value it less. But I do agree that it's, like, kind of, like, the, the definitive big Timmy card that also, like, backs it up. Like, if you, like, it's a Timmy card and it's, like, the, the emblematic of casual, but also if you don't deal with it, the person wins. I don't know. It's close. I don't know. I want to put both. I want to put both as my top one. <laughs> Ugh. Doubling season is very good. Like it is a, a an effect that is just powerful. But you can double your stuff, and I don't know. I as you know, I I'm all about pro uh, reactive. So it's just place. Yeah. For also, me. you don't you don't ever play it in your super friends because you don't play green. Yeah, and I, I don't touch green cards on top of that. So <laughs> it's probably a big a big factor in that too. <laughs> 
All right, we'll move on to, oh, this might be the hardest one for any of us to, to talk about. Yep. Six Drop is finally where things get super spicy. Um, I said you kick it off. Uh, what, what card do you think is the topmost spicy of Six Drop? Uh, this one, this one was ridiculously hard. There's like a list of 10, 20 cards that I think are there. Uh, the problem is there's nothing that stands out way above the rest of the pack, like Soul Rings and Mana Crypts. And there's a lot of really good cards that I play depending on the deck and the color I'm in. I ended up going with Consecrated Sphinx. I'm not very confident that this is actually the correct pick, but Consecrated Sphinx, uh, similar to Ristic Study, if you can get it on the battlefield, you're gonna draw a ridiculous amount of cards and quickly pull ahead of the table. It is kind of a fair card in the sense that you do need to have it sit out on the battlefield, and if your opponent just swords it or something, you don't get any value out of it. Not the best attacker, but like I said, I can see arguments for like 20 different cards here. So when it comes down to it, I'm going to go with the thing that draws me the most cards. <laughs> when in doubt, go with the thing that draws the most cards. I mean, at a four-player table, like if you have three opponents, at least uh, in a turn cycle, they're going to draw at least one card. So you're going to get to draw two cards. And you're going to do that three times. So you're going to draw so, six cards in a turn cycle. Which and is, you can like, get more you know, if someone ponders or preordains or whatever because it triggers off all that so it's definitely like refill your hand every turn essentially and there's no like paying for it like ristic study or smothering tide like this is just going to happen so it's definitely powerful but i want to hear what the rest of you think because i know there's so many good options here uh okay so on my end of things uh i have at six a new card actually uh, that, that just came out, and it's because it's Farewell. I, th I think Farewell is like one of the, the, I, I've been playing it a ton, right? I played in Commander, and every time I've casted it, oh boy, does it set the whole table back. Except me. So, like, and it works out perfectly because it's also graveyard hate. And I think that's what I love about it so much. The graveyard hate attached to it, it perfectly sits around with my planeswalkers. It's flexible. I don't have to choose two. I could choose three. I could choose all four. I, I think this is just one of the best answer sweepers in Commander, if not the. Like, so I'm in love with this card. I think this card is the truth. Thoroughly, all the way through, I think it's the truth. So good. I agree, I, I agree with Krim, bananas. but what if we spent three less mana on it and casted our revelation? Exile. Oh. The so exile. It's here on to inversion, ladies and gentlemen. It destroys all non-land permanents. At white, 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 three, so it's triple white, uh, but it's cost three less if there are ten or more non-land permanents on the battlefield. So I agree with Krim. A reset button at six is really strong, but I actually prefer our revelation because you get in for three, and also because I want my graveyard as a white player, uh, you know, if you're playing like white as a splash color, maybe you don't care about your graveyard. But if you're playing primarily white, I think you do care about your graveyard. So you don't want to nuke it. But uh, the X or your creatures, right? You don't want to nuke your creatures either. So I like our revelation. And it's a cheaty card because it's actually three mana, but I'll put it in my six drop slot. <laughs> oh, that's that's interesting because I actively dislike our revelation. I dislike outside of Andu Inversion, I dislike Rass that blow up everything and you don't have any control over it. Because I feel like there's so many decks where I'm like, I really don't want to destroy enchantments in this deck, or I really need my artifacts in this deck. So I think I'm on Team Krim with this one. I'd rather pay three more mana and have the option to be like, uh, all right, let's leave the artifacts on the table or let's leave the enchantments on the table than having to blow up everything, even at a discount. So I, I really hardly ever play Hour of Revelation for that reason. Yeah. And and indestructible is so common nowadays. That everything is indestructible that it gets a little annoying. So I'm just like, you know what? Let's just get rid of everything permanently. I like our revelation because it three mana is important in terms of redeploying. Like you can play a board wipe and then you can actually do more things on your turn. Whereas paying six mana, you're probably going to do a lot less uh, as a follow up. But farewell, being able to select what you choose, exiling and getting that those graveyards. Yeah, I, I like that more, even though I like both cards. But for me, I didn't choose even farewell. I chose Kodama of the East Tree which is, uh, mm. it's a green 6-6 six, six spirit from Commander Legends. It has partner, uh, it has reach because, you know, it's a Kodama. 
Um, and it says, whenever another permanent enters the battlefield under your control, if it wasn't put on the battlefield with this ability, you may put a permanent card with equal to or lesser mana value from your hand onto the battlefield. So basically, if you put a land on the battlefield, you put all the rest of your lands onto the battlefield. If you cast, if you put a just like any random permanent, you get to put another permanent equal or less onto the battlefield. You basically dump your entire hand. And every single time I've seen Kodama the East Tree be played, uh, regardless of the setting, it always overperforms. It's a house. It combos really easy with like bounce lands because you can keep bouncing itself over and over again and redeploying it. And that triggers infinite lane fall. So you can like make infinite treasures with tireless provision and all that stuff. But even if you're not doing combos and all that good stuff, just being able to like be, I play my six drop and then I play another permanent and oopsie, I played my entire board. It's like the ultimate ramp. It's basically like an omega smothering tithe or whatever, if you think about it, because you're circumventing, you know, cat paying the mana for these permits or or paying the mana to, you know, dump all these extra lands onto the battlefield. So I see this as like an omega six drop ramp spell that anytime I play anytime I see you play it, it's just kind of just like immediately afterwards, oh, I guess did I lose? I think so. <laughs> that's that's where I'm at on, on Kodama of the East Tree. This card has always over over uh over compensated in terms of uh how good green is at ramping. Wow. Um, that's the, the, me. Green is good at ramping, I, but like yeah, like I I always forget if you ever, that, I forget if you ever that's see, like a card. Yeah. If you ever see it partnered with a blue partner, you're gonna die. That's <laughs> it. That's it. You you cast those two things and you're in blue you're gonna die. You're in Civic. They're gonna draw a billion cards off Tet Yover or whatever, whatever equivalent. Does and it you just lose. die to Doom Blade? It, it, it does. does. It, so it, does people are waiting until like ten man or something to deploy this, or you like deploy this and cross your fingers and hope. Well, you, don't you can die. deploy this and then put a, a lane onto the battlefield, and then you can combo off if you have like a Karoo or whatever. Doesn't doesn't but. okay? If you spend six mana, does it not have to either a win the game or reset the board state? <sighs> does it? I feel like it has to be a very... landfall, then that could yes. win the game at six, yeah. right? Kadama sure. can can technically win in the right deck. It could, yeah. Okay. If anything, I just feel like <laughs> that's a vote against consecrated sphinx, probably, because <laughs> consecrated yeah. sphinx doesn't sphinx do any does of those die. things. But when yeah. it doesn't, when it sticks, you're up like six cards for six mana, and then higher than that usually too. Mm. Uh, Kadam was on my list. It's in that list of 10 or 20 cards that I was considering. <laughs> so I'm not going to, I mean, honestly, I'm not going to quibble with anyone's picks at six. Like, there's just so many good options. Yeah. I would say my second pick would be Farewell, but. Farewell, uh, yeah. Maybe I've been burned by Kadama too many times that I had to put it up there. I had to give it props. No, <laughs> you play more reactively. <laughs> yeah, the, you, you counter it. You counter yeah. it. And yeah, then yeah. they're in blue, and they counter you back, and then you yeah, die. yeah. Then, then it sucks, but you know whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you tried. That deck. Oh, that deck. All right. Uh, well, we had four different options for six drop tribal, or not six drop tribal. <laughs> six, six drop mana value. Uh, six drop tribal coming soon. I will move on to uh, seven drops. Um, Krim, well, kick it off. What, what, what do you think is this, the best card here? I think it's blatantly obvious that it's blatant thievery, right? <laughs> like, I mean, come on. This this card is sweet in a multiplayer game. It's so powerful because everybody does all the mana sinking in for you, right? They go put all their time, their turn into their best spell, and you just take it. You just like, give me that. Thank you. And and you and then obviously, okay. I will admit though, like when when you get down to like let's just say a one v one part of commander, it's obviously not going to be as powerful because you're only paying seven mana to steal one thing. But even then, it's still like I guess passable because you still get their best thing. But in at the start of a game, all three, all four players are there. That's three permanents. So I guarantee you, if you at least steal more than seven mana in things, that you'll have already made your your value back. And even then, Uh, if you steal a land, it's also pretty priceless. So, like, you can really set someone back on that, too. Well, what about when everyone's playing bad decks? I feel like on Commander Clash a few times, I've seen people play theft decks and been like, oh, no, everyone's everyone's on Bird Tribal, Shadowborn Apostle, like, just some really horrible janky theme, and it makes it less powerful. Is there any consistency concerns, do you think, with Latent Thievery? Not 
really, right? Like, it doesn't feel like there should, there would be. Okay. I, I mean, mean we're just going to land, land. Right, because yeah. like you could always steal the, your the, like your mana, uh, their mana base. Right, you could steal the homeward path if you need to, and then I don't know. I I love this card at, at seven. Like it does everything you want it to do. Right, it it takes anything. Hey, I've seen a bad blade in thievery, like a one we, that's we've like seen you. Phil cast bad blade in thievery. <laughs> Well, I know because I mean, I'm giving him the bad creature. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's it's never like, oh, this card was bad to play. Like, it was like not a... I always feel like it's worth seven mana, you know? Like, sometimes yeah, it just wins you the game, but... There's the, the, sometimes the you get totally wrecked by it. But, like, I think 95% of the time, you're happy with what you take. Like, just yeah, any... I, yeah. I don't feel bad about it cards. ever. Yeah, I think, I think it's a little bit harder when you're, like, a Gaunty deck and there's, like, Goblin Tribal versus... Energy tribal versus <laughs> alphabets S only tribal or something like that. And then you're like, even in that situation, guess also, you have something. You have something so, at that moment. Remember yeah. when Phil cast Blade Thievery? Or he wanted to, but I was phased out, so he couldn't. There's yeah, like okay. weird edge cases. Sure. <laughs> There's sure, weird okay, edge sure. cases with this, but, but they're super the, rare, right? That, in general, that you're going to get. That's one card that does that, right? Yeah. That's Teferi's yeah. Protection, which we've already established is like a house, <laughs> You, you right? would probably get three six drops with this. That's like 18 mana, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And and your choice. It's like tutoring almost, right? It's so, like right. also Omega removal too, if you think about yeah. it that way. Because you're not just gaining stuff. Your opponents are losing that stuff. So yeah. I think this card's kind well, of insane. It's I think, really yeah, they're, they're losing stuff and you're getting it, right? Which is like yeah. kind of like, okay, well, now you also have to answer this, the stuff that I've yeah. taken from you. So, I don't know. I, I think this card is just a thorough house. Yeah. Agree. Um, What about the rest of the table? Seth, what, what, what do you pick oh. as the top one? So, Richard mentioned how when you think of Commander, you think about doubling stuff up. Well, now we can take that even a step further and triple things up. And uh, I got I got Nick's Blue Mange in it. So, I know there's an issue with this pick. And the issue with the pick is this one really does die to Doomblade. Unless you get up to a big amount of mana and you can, like, kind of combo with it right away. You run it out. You got to wait to get back around to you. Everyone's going to try to kill it unless you get it set up. That is a big downside compared to Blatant Thievery or some of the other cards that I'm sure we're going to talk about. On the other hand, if you untap with Nick's Boom Ancient, it is maybe the most powerful thing you can have on the battlefield of magic when all your mana is tripled up it is so easy to win the game uh, you just play through your deck and do anything you want to like it, it's so so powerful so i don't know i, I think that nick's boom ancient with the downside of dying to doom blade uh is still just so powerful that it deserves to be number one on the seven drop list also shout out to ruinous ultimatum which i think is like sneakily really really good but you got to be in very specific colors to make it work you're not cheating a ruinous ultimatum. That that's like a you're hard cast than that one. That that is very <laughs> color heavy. But yeah, but, this one you can actually cheat out. Yeah, well, like I next can cheat is, ultimatum. You you can, but <laughs> like it's it's, harder. it's pretty miserable to try to cheat that one out. <laughs> yeah, this not, one you just reanimate for one mana. Like, but also this has also led to one of the coolest commander clash moments in history, where he did. <laughs> The like maximum the client could allow in terms of numbers. Yeah. Grim, Grim is still dead <laughs> I, from, yeah, uh, from that still game like a year ago. I'm still that in that why he's sitting out of this season, actually. <laughs> yeah. season. Recovering from that season's yeah. worth of damage. Every single time we start a recording with him, he just automatically loses before yeah. we can get starting hands. Like, it's weird. <laughs> Yeah, like that, that that was absolutely disgusting. But Nick's Blue Mansion, that's true. Like it is quite the powerhouse if you untap with it. But that's I don't know. Bad. It's just okay, I think. It's just like it, like it's powerful. I just don't think it's like anything amazing though. Mm -hmm. All right. There's something that doesn't die to Doomblade, and that's Richard's pick. All right, I can't believe no one chose this okay. card. It's I think to me clear and far away the best seven drop. <laughs> Uh, Delivian Primordial, 7 mana, 5, 5, flying. When it ETBs for each opponent, cast up to one target instant or sorcery from that player's graveyard without paying its mana cost, then exile it. So it's like Blatant Thievery, but for spells stapled to a 5, 5 flying body. Um, I don't know, there are a lot of powerful spells in Commander. Uh, even like the absolute worst case, you just get like triple Kadama's Reach or something. That's still actually not bad. 
Uh, but you could cast a ruinous ultimatum. You could cast yeah. an extra turn spell. You can cast like doom blades or whatever. Like you could cast whatever. So and then worst case, it's a seven mana five five flying. It's still pretty good, even if it did nothing, <laughs> right? So right. I think this card is really strong, and you can really net up on mana on this one. Uh, and you can blink it. You can uh, reanimate it. You can do all kinds of shenanigans to keep the the fun going. So I actually think. This is one of the strongest seven drops in, in the game. Uh, yeah, like that and the, the Sepultural, the, the Black Primordial, and then it, like definitely f- like is a little bit after this. But yeah, like I mean, this is definitely a respectful, uh, respectable like seven drop. Diluvium Primordial is pretty solid. I, I do play it, actually. It's, it's a great card. But the it's always been like a budget high. go-to. Yeah. yeah. Although, are you happy if you get a rampant growth in a couple of Kadamas reaches or something. Like there's some times where it's not that great, but uh, there's other times it. when it's like literally win <laughs> the game or <laughs> graveyard. Hey, well now we got farewell running around. So graveyards getting white might be a little maybe. bit more likely. So maybe that makes it a little worse, but yeah, you I can't mean, get it's, it's super bomby. Untimely scavenger grounds or something <laughs> like that. Mm. But yeah, yeah, that card's legit. I, I, I enjoy it. It's always been a budget staple of mine as well. ETB gets even better. Um, How is it still it, cheap? Has it been reprinted? I think it's kind of reprinted a bunch. And also, a lot of people say, like, oh, sudden drops aren't playable anymore or, or whatever nonsense. But, like, every single time I see a Diluvian Primordial, a Blade and Thievery, even Exclamation, I'm like, you on top of that. That's 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 game, I think. Um, and my my pick, though, is is a recent card, or fairly recent, two years ago, uh, Eerie Ultimatum. This is an Abzan Sorcery. And it says, return, return any number of permanent cards uh, with different names from your graveyard to the battlefield. It doesn't get back your instants and sorceries, but everything else, your lands, your creatures, your planeswalkers, your artifacts, your enchantments, those all go from your graveyard immediately to the battlefield. This is like one of my favorite cards in terms of like, you know, the game has gone late. You've suffered a couple board wipes or whatever. And you just you tap out seven mana, eerie ultimatum, your entire board's back. Boom, baby. It's even better if you have like self mill and stuff like that, but like let's not get fancy here. Just like any random Abzan deck, I think, as a top end, it just like you get so much value. And especially if like those are ETB creatures or ETB stuff, like you get your Rex Age triggers, your whatever, your E Wit to get back an important instant or sorcerer or something like that. This card has always impressed me whenever whenever I cast it, so I gotta give it a shout out here. I mean, it's really strong. It does have the graveyard hate problem though. Like that's the only downside mm-hmm. is there are someone plays their planner void on turn one, and you're you're pretty sad with the <laughs> the eerie ultimatum in hand. What but. monster? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 never, monster. Casting I could cost. never. <laughs> Two, four, six, seven mana symbols in that, <laughs> in that yeah. casting cost is the hard part. But yeah, you're playing green in there, so you're probably good. Right, yeah. and we have World Tree to fix this as well. So <laughs> World Tree not is as nice. much of an issue. You yeah. can get World Tree from the graveyard five color deck, Boom. but yeah, <laughs> you can sack World Tree for the whatever thing, get all the gods, and then you can eerie ultimatum right afterwards and get back to World Tree, and you can do it again. Well, with the new triomes in Capanna, I don't think mana symbols are a thing anymore. Like they, they're already kind of a meme, but now I think they are 100 percent a meme. With if you play like non-budget uh, fetches. Uh, mm. You can assemble like quad black, quad green, or something <laughs> like no problem anymore. So I think mana cost is no longer an issue. Doubly so if you're in green and you have all your yep. nature's lords green, and all yeah, the ways green to tutor you things out. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Get your triumphs and your dual lands easy. Okay, uh, we'll move on to eight drops, and the spice continues because we have four different options uh, amongst four different people. Um, so, Richard, kick it off. What, what do you think uh, is your top pick? All right. Uh, it's it's S tier, definitely, because it's even the best eight drop, in my opinion. And that's Undo Inversion. <laughs> eight mana, destroy all nine line permanents. <laughs> and it's a land on the backside. <laughs> uh, is it technically a zero drop, though, because it's of the land bar? Like, th- does this qualify as, a, as an eight drop? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> you're casting The problem it, with right? eight drops right is like oh you know commander's too fast you can't get to eight mana right or you more realistically you're missing land drops you can't actually get to eight mana even though everyone else is you drop it as a land right you can pick it up as a bounce land uh, with a bounce land and then eight mana reset the board 
uh, very powerful. So I think, you know, obviously if it's just eight mana, reset the board, no backside, then it doesn't deserve its spot. But the fact that you can play it for a land to smooth out your curve, I think is really strong. Kind of like Cyclonic Rift, where you can do the cheaty two mana mode. You can do the cheaty, I play it as a land mode, and then get it back later by bouncing it. So I, I like Undoed version. You can tell I like Sweepers and <laughs> Ramp in my list here. Uh, I... <laughs> I love Ondu Inversion. It's not my pick for the best eight drop, but uh, it's in every single deck that I can possibly put it in. Yeah. it's If, if it's in white, I play it. Even if I'm an aggro deck, I play it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so good. I like it, too. I put no. it in most of my well, white deck. Have you deck. changed your mind? Uh, <laughs> oh, no, didn't you get it an F or something, no. Tomer? Hmm. It gets it gets a solid A. What I think it gets an I, A, which is not an S like everybody else. And I just get memed S. on forever because I didn't I think bet. it was the best MDFC of all time. I'm so it's sorry. The best of all time. I think we it's need our not. the editor to pop up a little clip of the MDFC podcast because I remember some harsh words coming That's from me. Tomer. I remember uh, monologues about <laughs> you put that on me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Did, yeah, Tomer, I'll give it like, like a still better. No, uh, Malakir Rebirth still better. I'm sorry. I'm just spitting facts. Well, I, I don't see facts. showing up at number one on any of this yeah. list. <laughs> yeah, where's your Malakir Rebirth over Soul Ring, Tomer? If you really had that yeah. conviction. Oh, <laughs> oh boy. Malakir Awakening over Rhystic Study. Those are some spice steaks. All right. Surprise. This is just MDFC tier list. <laughs> All we right. Brought so you what, do you, what do you got for a drop? Oh, boy, I have the best eight drop for sure, which is Crater of Behemoth. Nothing kills people in Commander the way that Crater Hoof does. Uh, you just, uh, if you don't know Crater Hoof, it, it pretty much just says kill someone. It's an eight mana five five with haste. When it comes into play, creatures you control get trampled and get plus X plus X, where X is the number of creatures you control until end of turn. So you're a green deck. You probably get a bunch of mana dorks. You make a bunch of random bodies. You play this, your stuff becomes like 15, 15 tramples, and you definitely kill someone. You might kill the entire table, depending on uh, the blockers. It is just the premier finisher for decks that have creatures in it. Um, and I think that that makes it the best state drop. Like, again, coming back to the choice between being proactive or reactive, like, I don't know. Why, like, why do I, I love on new inversion, but why do I need to, to sweep away the board when I can just drop a crater hoof with a board and make you die before you get to play your on new inversion? Uh, because because the you should probably respect the fact that maybe you won't have a board because Crater of Behemoth <laughs> could be pretty bad if you don't have anything. Uh, <laughs> honestly, the the only reason I don't play Crater Hoof is I feel like it's too easy. I intentionally yeah. leave it out of some decks because I feel like it's so overpowered that it's almost just like cheat mode to kill someone where you just like ramp a little bit and cast it and like one shot someone on turn five. So the only reason I don't play it is because I feel guilty that it's so good, which I think is is a testament to how strong it is and should put it pretty high on the list. Like, if you're leaving the card out of your decks because it's so strong, that's got to make it one, at least one of the strongest cards of its mana value, I think. I think it being a creature kind of, like, puts it way above most other similar overrun effects because it is a 5-5 body itself. It has haste, and green is so good at tutoring up and cheating it to play green creatures. Uh, like Green Sun Xena, the finale and devastation. But also there's like one word that like you can sacrifice a green creature to put a green creature from your library onto the battlefield. Eldritch um, Evolution. Yeah. Uh, there's like nat you natural order. Like that. Yeah. Natural order. Yeah. This, so is, like, this is a build around me card though, right? Like yeah. you can't just slap it in any like you need to actually be going wide. Like if you just have like three creatures that are big or something, you cast Crater Hoof, that's not enough. You actually need to like be making tokens or lots of elves or something, which which opens you up to like farewell and other stuff that's below eight man <laughs> that might set you back to the stone ages. <laughs> so it is an I win the game, but you need to actually be in that position, right? It's a little which bit is why I like Richard's the vanilla white and he's just sweeper. playing every board wipe tribal and <laughs> well, well, there's Grixis like a propaganda out or something. Friends. You're like, well, <laughs> right? You're like, oops. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't think you got to build around it that much. Like, you're right. You don't, you don't want one you, or two you big don't creatures, but it. I don't think you got to be like a token deck. If you're just like, hey, I'm a green deck and I'm playing yeah. creatures because I'm a green deck, like, this just goes into to close out the game and be the finisher. So I don't think you got to so be you like, only need, dedicated tokens or something. You only need two other creatures on the battlefield for it to be an eight mana overrun that supplies a 5 5 creature alongside it, right? Like, yeah. 
you, you have two other creatures. It will enter the battlefield. It'll give your creatures plus three, plus three, and trample. And itself has hay. So it's hitting for eight. Uh, your other creatures are hitting for at least four or greater, usually. So it's like 16 damage, man. And well, <laughs> that's I mean, but that's, that's like its worst case scenario, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. Is like, but generally speaking, when you castle, when you have like five, six creatures on the battlefield, which is not like an absurd amount, it's and- just like an amount. And something I've noticed playing other overruns, like we just recently had a game where it was casting uh, overruns, casting the in fact one triumph of the hordes, and it's not always enough to kill everyone. It's like okay, I got a bunch of creature that casts an overrun, like I can kill someone, but then I'm gonna die in the backswing because Creator Hope triggers based on the number of creatures on the battlefield. You don't usually have to worry about that with Crater Hoof. Like in those situations, you drop the Crater Hoof, and pretty much everyone is dying if you got a reasonable ward. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I see Krim though. You're on team. Uh, you're on team. Answer the board instead yep. of. Uh, <laughs> Imagine that. Board. To nobody's <laughs> surprise, right? Naturally, I would be on team. Answer the board here. This this is exactly hmm. like like the kind of play style I like, right? I mean, I want to I want to answer the board. I want to slow it down. I want to make the crater hoofs useless, right? Like that's that's the goal, uh, because those those are it, it's always better to me because i i guess because the play style and like the pattern is i'm usually on the back pedal and i and since i'm always on the back pedal i'm looking to reset the board consistently and 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 if i get a turn to reset and no one has a strong follow-up usually i win the game from there uh because then that's when i deploy my best threat whether it's the best planeswalker and then it, and that's why i would choose ugin the spirit dragon, which is wonderful because it itself is a sweeper. It exiles. I, okay, except for artifacts and stuff like that. But like it exiles, and and then afterwards, if if you aren't if the board isn't like loaded with a bunch of like seven plus drops, I've now got a planeswalker that's going to continue to keep upticking and doing things, and I love that. So I don't know. This card just seems exactly like what I want uh, out of an eight mana card. It's a it's a sweeper that's answering like everything. That's not an artifact. I love Ugin, but I only play it in certain color combinations. Like, if I'm in the Andu Inversion deck, I feel like I don't need Ugin as much. So I definitely think it's one of the most powerful cards. But I don't know. For me, it's more of like a color-specific staple than something that I would rank as, like, the literal number one eight drop overall, personally. But but where else are you going to get something that clean answers anything that isn't colorless and as wizards continues to like like you know like and 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 yeah you can get more there are technically other effects but attached to a planeswalker that can live around and just keep paying other small creatures people's like setting like like trying to set up again you can like set them back Mm -hmm. now they're in a like weird bind where they have to answer this ugin i i don't know it just feels like the exact thing you want right like like it is it is super strong like it's just so efficient, and the fact that it goes in every deck, it can go in every deck, is pretty big. It should go in every deck. I <laughs> should play it more often. I mean, we talked about this during Planeswalker Week as well, and I, 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 I skipped over it a lot of the time. But like, I should be playing it more often. But also, Ugin though, I mean, Ugin's so though. good. <laughs> the, the real it's question so is, good. It, it can't get mana rocks. Like, it can't so get if mana you rocks. get mana rocks, you usually end someone. Like. Like, if you sweep the board, they can just recast their commander, right? If you sweep the board with their mana rocks, they're probably toast for, like, two, three turns before they can do anything useful again. Especially if you have an Ugin to pick off any small creatures they're playing. Yeah. So I I definitely do like Ugin. But then I just play white, so I don't have to deal with this. But, like, in (laughs) non-white, like, Ugin's all you got. So, like, you take it and be happy with it, right? So I I do like it in non-white decks. I also like the flexibility of that. If you do wipe the board and nobody has a threat on the table, you play Ugin. Ugin is now actually going to be an engine that becomes a finisher. So oh, if you can the ultimate flexibility it, of it is nice. The ultimate's great. Like if you can actually yeah. play it on an empty board and there's some chance you get to the ultimate, it is probably going to win you the game. Or if there's just like one small creature on the battlefield and you just zap it every <laughs> single turn. You know what I mean. I mean, you like yeah, Toxic okay. Deluge, Ugin, or yeah. new version. Not new version. Our, Our revelation, revelation yeah, Ugin. Ugin. Uh, like you're, you're in yeah. a pretty sweet spot there. <laughs> right. Uh, they, you're now got you're like you're pretty much your hand on anything that happens, right? Like if if you can pretty much determine what goes and what doesn't. 
Mm-hmm. But then the crater hoof comes down with haste and smashes <laughs> Ugin. So crater hoof got to be on Then he got his high five. Yeah, but I got you to play your crater hoof. Um, okay, so the the card that I had here, I didn't really have a good answer. I thought Crater Hoof kind of was uh, my choice as well. But then I thought about, hey, there's a card that I haven't played personally in a long time. We haven't played personally, but yeah. it's mostly because we have like kind of like an agreement not to. That's like and Shadow Band. Insurrection. Yeah, Shadow it's kind Band. of Shadow Band alongside Edric, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, it's Insurrection. This is an eight. This is I'm obviously it's an eight drop, <laughs> but it's a red eight drop sorcery. Untap all creatures and gain control of them until end of turn. They gain haste until end of turn. So you just cast a spell and then you just yoink everybody's creatures until end of turn. They have haste and then you just attack. Generally speaking, whenever I saw an Insurrection cast, it's gonna kill at least one person. Many <laughs> times it's killed the entire board. Uh, but yeah, it's just basically eight mana end somebody's day because you just grab everybody's creatures and you just swing at them with, with their own creatures. It's um, so sweet. <laughs> it's, it's, very, so sweet. it's very sweet, but like we kind of avoided playing it and you just don't see it in Commander Clash anymore. I don't have it in any of my decks anymore. and we, I just kind of took it out because it was too easy, but I it's been many years. It's been many years since I've seen this card cast. Do you think it's still as good as it used to be or is this something that maybe has been kind of like power crept out that is just isn't worth talking about i i think it's it's still good it's still good right like you do nothing you just sit there you hold the mana and then and then like everybody spends their turn sinking like it's it's like you just essentially skip their turn and you got to kill them with their own spells it's great it's absolutely great I think it's troll card. <laughs> I think it's still good, but I do wonder if it's gotten a little less good. Like it's amazingly good in a world of battle uh, battle cruiser magic when everyone's just trying to like play these big creatures and beat down. But the more like comboy the format gets, and the more spell slinger decks and storm like ways to win without making a big board of creatures, I feel like that docks the power a little bit. But I still think it. It's it's very high on my list of eight drops, and I think a lot of games like it is going to at least kill someone and maybe just win the game when you cast it. So even though I think it's a little worse than it used to be, I still think it's very very strong. It being a little worse than it used to be, I think is still fine, right? Because like it's it's an absolute game. Probably, that might be good I, because that's like wait we stopped playing it because it felt so cheaty and easy, and we had so many games that would just come down to like oh someone cast insurrection and nothing we did for the rest of the game mattered. So. Being a little less good might actually be a positive. Like maybe maybe we should start trying it again. Maybe we I'm kind of curious. It it's been like years since we played it, so I'm actually yeah. kind of curious to see like how it would play today. I mean, you will actually see the proactive cards starting from like five man up. We don't play because they're too good, right? Like you slap <laughs> yeah. an eerie ultimatum, you probably won the game. You slap an insurrection, you probably won the game, right? You resolve a diluvian primordial, you probably win the game. So like. We don't do it because we it leads to like uninteresting games, right? And especially since we play low powered uh, cards. So if you play with higher power, you you won't get to eight mana to do this, right? It's like very difficult, and you you're gonna like insurrection to dock side or something. It's gonna be very sad. Right? <laughs> but if you're playing like janky tribal creatures and loading up on like five mana two twos, an insurrection against that is like really strong. And I think insurrection's a better crater hoof, right? Like you don't. Need to do anything, right? Like you sit there yeah. empty board, you insurrection, and then you kill the person who had the most creatures. So that's removal for those creatures as well after combat. So I think it's just too strong. Like it could get worse in the sense that you now have like fierce guardianship, uh, stuff like that to to kind of interact with it, uh, or you could do fairies mm. protection to to phase out. But I still think it's fairly strong, and I think if we play it. Whoever plays it will just win the game, and we're like, "Good job." And then we're like, <laughs> next game, we're like, does he have insurrection in his deck? We better kill him. Don't tell yeah, him about right. this card. No. It's just, it's just so anticlimactic. Like, it's so bad yeah. for time because you like, what? well, you just like have this whole game of magic, and then it's just like, oh, here's this one card combo. It ends out of nowhere. Like that's how I've always felt about it. At least, like it's a a disappointing ending to a good game. 
People are salty See, uh, about two card combos. How about a one yeah. card combo, right? I, I feel it's somewhere on the same power level as Crater Hoof, though. I feel like it's the like exact opposite, though. Like, Insurrection requires your opponents to have good board saves, whereas Crater Hoof requires you to have a good board save. And also, Crater Hoof is a creature, so it's easier to get it when you need it. So, yeah. I don't know. And I feel like, yeah. like you can control what's in your deck, but not in your opponent's deck. So if you're playing yeah. Crater Hoof, like theoretically it should be good in your deck, but if you're playing Insurrection, maybe you run into Krim and his I only play yeah. opposition agent as creature that, that's deck. That's why people and don't like, like Insurrection, eh. right? Like you spent yeah. the whole game building your board for a Crater Hoof and you won, good job. Versus <laughs> you spent the whole game doing nothing and we spent all of our game doing something and then you cast yeah. one spell and win the game. Like it feels bad, I think. And that's... theoretically three opponents should have more creatures than one player. Yeah. So yeah. it should it's, do that's more so... damage on average. I just, I just don't, like, okay, so... I guess my thing is like, how is that not sick? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like it's sick. But when everything when you when said is true. Many games end with but it, how I is that not like... sick? Right? Like, whoa, that's sweet, right? <laughs> Come on. Here it lies the differences in philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. It's kind of like it's kind of like seeing uh, Risen Reef pop off. He's like, oh wow, that's really sick. But then you see it again, and it's like, oh yeah, it's really easy to do this good job and then there's the third one it's like please please find something else <laughs> the and then the fourth time, time it's like kill to kill phil first. first yeah kill phil first <laughs> oh i almost got my civic tickets very different and it's just like no. <laughs> kill him first i love it i i think it's sweet. like and I, I'm, I'm sorry like if, if every time i will love it it's just such a cool thing to see i don't it know i've, cool I've always i've always thought that and like i it's not like i've never gotten like got by it or i've never played with i've obviously done both but every time i you want know, it, it just brings a smile to my face i'm just like you know that that's pretty cool <laughs> that's pretty cool all right you don't even play creatures back at least my game why would why would <laughs> it possibly bother creatures. you and your zero creatures like <laughs> yeah. no you wonder you don't mind insurrection <laughs> you don't steal planeswalkers that's the main thing and he still planeswalkers as well and then criminal no no I, 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 all I all have, permanents oh, wait, i have a rogue deck i have a ninja deck, deck. No. Uh, no, there's like zealous conscripts which can steal a planeswalker. You can steal you can a steal planeswalker. A yeah. 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 Oh, okay, this one's coming down the pipeline. I'm sure we're gonna get a steal all planeswalker Ooh. card. Raider Legends too, baby. Uh, all non land <laughs> permanents. That'd be sweet. <laughs> no, all per just steal all. Just all, just all. <laughs> all permanents. I'll take them all. <laughs> Untap them. They gain haste until they're zero. That would oh, be boy. so sick. <laughs> Not even until end of turn, just forever. <laughs> okay, Jeweled <that's>... insurrection. <laughs> I mean, I, um, I I think insurrection's a fine magic card. So I, I think it's fun. I think it's hilarious. At the end of the of the day, I I love it. So I want to see it in Commander Clash one time. Maybe not me playing. You have. It, but I want to see it again. Oh, okay. It's again. been a while. That yeah, I think the last time was the Christmas episode with Mudsta. Hmm. It's been a while. Yeah. All right, we'll move on from eight drops to nine drops. We've got two more drops to talk about, really. And this one is a little bit more. The, the options have shrunk a little bit. The carpool has shrunk a little bit. And we, we most of us have agreed that expropriate is uh, our top pick. It's me, Seth, and Krim believe that expropriate, I don't know how to... Uh, You're saying it right, loading. I think. There, there, expropriate. There we go. It's a nine drop uh, blue sorcery, has council's dilemma. Starting with you, each player votes for time or money. For each vote, take an extra turn after this one. Uh, for each vote, uh, take an extra turn after this one uh, for time. Uh, and for money, uh, you get a permanent by the voter, uh, chosen by the voter. Or so you choose a permanent from any person who chooses uh, money. So you get, to, you get at least either one extra turn or get to steal, or I guess I guess you just get to steal, take one extra turn. You get to take one extra turn, and then your opponents get to decide whether you get to take more extra turns or you get to steal one of their things. So it's like an Omega Blade and Thievery slash time stretch that your opponents have some say over. You're gonna get four things uh, happening, and you get to choose one, but your opponents get a say in it. So, so I mean in. And since no. you get to choose, you're guaranteed at least one extra turn. Like you so, turn. usually, you want an extra turn, so you like are all assured to get an extra turn. 
And then worst case, I don't even know what the worst case is, but you know, like you get a blatant thievery, or maybe you just take all the turns and like win the game that way. Like this is another card on our shadow a shadow ban list where we saw it a few times in the early years of Commander Clash, right after it came out, and we were just like, we this is not how we want games to end. Like this just isn't fun that for one card you cast it and it's about as close to win the game. Like it's very close to just saying like win the game on a nine mana sorcery. Even Phil hasn't put it in oh, a deck. Yet. I don't think he knows about it. So sh- <laughs> I hope he doesn't, doesn't watch this podcast because because once is he it, does, is it insurrection like the same? Like you take permanence, you take an extra turn. That turn you attack, right? Yeah. Unless you're somehow stealing a combo piece or something. Like isn't it just like more expensive insurrection? I, I guess I you keep them. So if for whatever reason need... the job is not finished, you can keep going. <laughs> yeah. But also, if your if your opponents don't have creatures on the battlefield or do, doesn't have enough to do enough of an impact, yeah, 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 like yeah. you don't even kill somebody, then this one is like oh, always guaranteed to get a lot of value out of it. Right. I think this one. I, this one's nine mana though. This one's it it nine is. mana. You're usually right. you're usually not paying the cost. You're finding some way of casting it another way, right? Or you're Simic, and then you just be like, I'm green. Ha 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 ha. Ram, 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 Cast it to I don't, I don't, I don't like, like this card. This, this card actually is a. Expropriate. Th- th- this card is whack. This card's whack. I, I don't, I don't think this card. But you love, you love <laughs> stealing stuff. Yeah, yeah, but I don't like the extra turn part of it. Uh, well, oh, okay. just, just vote, vote, vote it down. Take another permanent. You don't have <laughs> yeah. to vote for an extra turn. No, I know, but yeah. like the thing here is like I think that this card is kind of like absurd. I think this yeah. is way more powerful than than uh than expropriate. I'm, and, uh, I'm surprised. Oh, sorry. Oh no no. I was gonna say I'm surprised we aren't unanimous on this. Like, what else is even possibly in the same ballpark? Oh, right. Richard it, got it, it, is, it is I chose the best card. card. <laughs> what? I chose a different card. You chose a different card. Nine, nine mana is nigh uncastable. Okay, I'm not one of those <laughs> like magic is too fast hipsters, but like, okay, guys, like nine mana is a lot. How about I choose the Great Henge? Technically, nine mana, probably two. Uh, every time you tap it, you gain two life, add two green. When a non token creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on it, draw a card. I think this is... And you gain two life whenever you tap. Mm-hmm. It's very strong, but it's, like, playable. Like, you don't need to go to some weird board state where you can cast a nine drop. You can play this on turn four or five and happily gain advantage from it. So, yes, on turn 11, if I have nine mana, I will cast Expropriate. But in a normal game, I think Great Henge is, like, far more powerful. And you'll actually get value and do stuff with it. Wait, but then do you not agree that we should shadow ban expropriate? Do you think it's just not good enough? I don't enough? care about it. Wow. Ah, no, wow. please do not tell that to Phil. Do yeah. not, Richard. <laughs> please. Why? <laughs> We're begging you. <laughs> no. No. I don't man. think it's that bad. Because you oh. spent. Not, so normally with extra turns, right? Oh, you no. do something and then you take an extra turn for like two mana. It's obnoxious. Here you spent your entire turn taking the turn. So, <laughs> like. It's like an insurrection that lasts a little longer, right? Like, I don't think it's... No? Am I wrong? Uh, I think we should bring what, it back what, what, and see how it goes. Y'all bring it back. You know <laughs> Phil's going to jam it immediately. You're, Phil listens to the play podcast, some by the way. Tat- you over to <laughs> electric boogaloo crap on us, and we're going to... We're gonna, I, I don't even want to say I told you so to Richard, because I have to live through it. I have I to thought, be in I that game. you Homeward Path. We're good, right? <laughs> you have to play Homeward. He steals the Homeward Path. <laughs> and then... <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Oh, and then Ugin's Nexus to uh, to shut down the extra turns, and then we're fine. We'll just start adding those to all of our decks. <laughs> he plays oh, the that. Uh, maybe I haven't. Maybe I haven't. Matter really of power. I I do feel like you have a good argument for Great Henge. Honestly, when I made my list, it was Expropriate and then Great Henge, and then shout out to Blasphemous Act because just mostly because Red doesn't have other sweepers that are uh, hard sweepers or many of them. Uh, so I think that that deserves like a mention. But you're very right that like both Great Henge and Blasphemous Act kind of cheat on the mana value like they're nine mana but you can cast them much earlier in the game so you're going to see them much more often they're going to have a much bigger impact on like your average commander game because sometimes you're not going to get to nine mana with expropriate so even though i think assuming you can cast the cards expropriates like 
not even anywhere in the same stratosphere as these other guys, like so far above. It is true that some games you don't get to cast it, and that I guess should probably count for something. The fact that you can a Great Henge for two mana or Blasphemous Act for one mana. Yep. Mm-hmm. I mean that was that was the card that I, I actually had on my list originally, which was Blasphemous Act. But I'm just like expropriate so much better, right? And and, and I and I, I also like wrote it off because of that exact reason. Like, oh well expro- I mean uh Blasphemous Act, Great Henge, these are all like reduced costs. So it's not like a true nine drop, right? So I had to go with a real nine drop, and I think that yeah, very <laughs> much so expropriate is a, a you're paying the nine mana. outside of like cheating it with like some like Prime like Diluvian Primordial or something. It, it is so hard to get to nine mana. Yeah, like, you remember you start but, with seven cards in hand, right? So if those are all seven lands, you're still two lands and expropriate short, <laughs> right? Uh, so you need to be drawing lots of lands and enough cards to stay alive, and then you expropriate. So it's it's really hard to cast. You have to cheat it. If you can cheat I, it, it's absurd, right? Yeah, I feel like but even if you don't cheat it, like there's enough ramp in the in the form. Like you can't just jam into any deck and be like, oh, actually, man, I think you can. Honestly, I think you can. <laughs> I think, like, once you reach, you will reach nine mana eventually, like, turn six or whatever. And when you do, you're like, congratulations. You have to do it with lands, though, because if you cast mana rocks by turn eight or something, someone (laughs) will farewell you away, right? So (laughs) it needs to be lands to ramp you this way. It's not always going to be farewell in every game. Dockside extortionists, Uh, right? Like, you have to do one of these, like, burst mana, (laughs) mana geyser type things. Then you can do it. Once you get there, you just, like, that's GG. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I would just uh, do I, I like Great Henge too. I don't know if it's GG. <laughs> I, <laughs> oh. Has Great has Appropriate ever not won the game? I, I Have we seen it cast? We've seen like, it like, right? a long time I've ago. been on the receiving end on a lot of expropriates back in a my day. A long time ago. <laughs> like I, I think there was one time where we gave person like we had a wait he had no board state and we all were like, you know what? He has he was in top deck mode and we he has no board state. We'll just give him time. And he ma- he took four extra turns and he didn't manage to clinch it and we got we got to kill him. But like that's such an extreme. Like you have to have no board say, no cards mm-hmm. in hand, and or we ha- you have no good permanence on the battlefield. Like it's like ah, oh, it's so much. I'm so curious. Many ifs. What, what do you guys rate? What's what's the best extra turn spell in Commander besides Expropriate? And how Next highly do you fate. rate that? Is it just the literal extra turn that's so powerful? Yeah, time warp. Yeah, I think any, any of them just like absurdly powerful yeah like i think i would say because you also cheat uh, it out that is 10 mana really yeah hmm i don't know it, like if there wasn't a bias against extra turns would you just play them in every deck i feel like i would like if i if i had the colors i would just run them for value i'd I run expropriate i wouldn't run like time time stretch or whatever mm, or, hey. mm. i have to be a combo deck otherwise it's like five mana to like draw and do an extra combat right like you actually have to make value this extra turn right you can't just do a value extra turn this is not yeah. standard also thank god it exiles when it when it resolves like come on oh yeah okay because <laughs> yeah. the game is going to continue anyway like <laughs> uh, do you imagine you winning this back to your hand oh oh jeez <laughs> All right, well, we've got one more card we can talk about. Eh, kind of. It's a 10 drop. Uh, take it away, Seth. What do we got here? This one is unanimous. No debate, <laughs> and that is uh, Omniscience. <laughs> 10 mana enchantment. You can cast cards from your hand without paying their mana cost. Uh, we have huh, seen this card on Commander Cash kind of recently. I think Phil has had it on the battlefield sort of, sort of recently. It's absurdly powerful. Like, Richard uh, had it on a battlefield too. Richard I remember. had it on the battlefield recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, magic is balanced around the mana cost of cards. <laughs> like that's that's how the game works. Turns Some out, cards yes. cost more than others. The more expensive cards are usually more powerful than the cheaper cards. Omniscience just gets rid of that rule. Your uh, Emrakul costs the same as your Soul Ring and your Mana Crypt. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone play an Omniscience and lose, honestly. It's theoretically possible that you're, like, empty-handed and you play it and you don't have something to follow it up. But normally you play it and then you cast free card draw spells and next thing you know you have a huge board and you play through your whole deck uh, because you're breaking one of maybe the fundamental rule of the game of Magic. So... Uh, it's busted. You can reanimate it in some decks. You can cheat it into play with show and tells and all these shenanigans. You can ramp into it. 
if you get it on the battlefield, you pretty much win. Yeah. I mean, can you lose with this? I guess like <laughs> if the only way. On your hand. Yeah, if you're empty handed or if someone just has roiling vortex and you just like are at five or something. I, like this <laughs> Yes, <is> got him. <laughs> I like <laughs> it. lightning bolt. <laughs> like like yeah, it's, it's I a combo know. piece. You know if you put it fairly in your deck, you will lose, right? But people who have missions in their deck. I don't know, I don't know deck, about that. Like if you just play this not. fairly, right? You don't you don't think you can just <laughs> you have to have the ten mana I, and have a full grip of cards, right? Yo, like, you, you need to be playing around this. I feel like Richard thinks nine and ten mana is way harder than it is because he always plays mono white. Like I feel like Phil <laughs> is at ten mana by like turn four every <laughs> every, he has every game. Dagger. That's yeah, plus two. <laughs> it's it's very uh, you not only ten. 10 mana plus a full grip, right? You have to build around it. You can't just slap yeah. this into a blue deck and call it a day. Like, you'll never Truth cast it, it, right? Like, the best case is a pitch is the all the cards. I don't know if I'm mean, great at that. that. <laughs> I don't know I if I slam it in just totally a blue could. deck. You, you need to have, like, mega ramp. You need to have, like, mm. Urza ramp or something, right? Or, like, actual, like, real ramp. And you need ways to fill your hand to keep going once this... You know, resolves because like no one's gonna let you keep this there, right? Like if you try to resolve this, and you're like, oh wait, let me untap to draw um, cards with go. If you can study or something, this, right? You're a master. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Just let, let, let it resolve. This. Just let me keep this one. <laughs> Look at that over there. <laughs> so I'll get you next turn. Slide I'll get you the next table. Turn. So it is a combo piece, and chances are, if the combo player puts down half their combo, they're probably gonna win, <laughs> right? So yeah, I don't think you see this and you live ever. I think you're gonna die if you see this because they successfully enacted their combo plan. That's fair. I mean, we don't have a lot of options, I guess. There's time stretch. There's, I think, primal search is probably the single best card, but you have to build your entire deck around it. Primal, yeah. primal search says like if you have no non-land, if you have no uh, non permanence in your library. You just get to take your library, you flip it onto the battlefield, and at that point you won. Uh, but like, you have to have a deck that is catered to that. But there's a there's a couple of decent Eldrazi. Kozilek, uh, original Kozilek's ten mana, new Ulamaga's ten mana. But I don't I don't think they quite stand up to stuff like Omniscience. New Ulamog, by the way, is. Like seventy five dollars, something like that. Like, Wait, wow. Which one's Whoa. new? Ulamog. Did uh, the Cecil Cecil Zunger. Zunger. one? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's new. That's like so old by now. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> the like, new. That's like six years old. <laughs> to new the old. To, to the muggles. Yeah. <laughs> to, to us, the average human. <laughs> All right. Um. Well, that's gonna be it for basically the debate on uh, what cards we figure are the most powerful for mana values. Beyond 10, the card pool just shrinks dramatically. Um, so I guess, Seth, if you maybe you could just mention yeah. what, what the other cards are, and then we'll just, that'll be it. Just for the sake of completion, uh, 11. There are a couple of 11s, not many, but uh, Ulamog the Infinite, uh, Geyer is probably number one. 12 mana, there's like five or something. Blightsteel Colossus, I think, is way far ahead of everything else. 13 mana. The only option, I believe, is uh, Emrakul, the newer of the Emrakuls. Uh, 14 mana, one card, Blink Moth Infusion. It is horrible, but it is only 14, so it wins by default. Uh, Auto Chuthion Worm, only 15 that's legal in Commander. 16, Draco. And uh, yeah, so most of those cards just win literally by default because they're the only option or the only realistic option of their mana values. And... And there you go. That, that we went from zero to the highest currently is sixteen. I think we we're did gonna get a, a seventeen in New Capenna or something. Probably. Hmm? So, oh. uh, yeah. Wait, did they say was that one of like uh, Mara's one of the teasers? Hints? I believe. I think it was like fifteen in double black. I, I, I remember. It. Oh, it was something like that. Yeah. It could be. It might have been thirteen. We'll it might have been thirteen double black. I don't. Can't remember. wait to uh, reveal that. Just be like steal all your with opponent's Bob. cards and go home with them. <laughs> <laughs> it might be like Delver or something. Like, it, you know, like all like, these cards are like really old. Like the our high CMC cards or high mana value cards. I wonder what a twenty twenty two designed seventeen mana card looks like. It's gonna oh, have some you wild mana cheat reductions. On it, like, yeah, it's, it's gonna it probably cost Delver costs one less for each creature you <laughs> sacrifice this turn. It's some nonsense. Well, but it will be good for Yuriko. Yuriko don't care. Yuriko, <laughs> put that off the top of the like You can take 15 anyway. You don't take care. 17 now? Jeez. Yeah. Sounds great. <laughs> Sounds good. 
Um, all right, so that's it for our show, everybody. We went from zero to 16. Uh, let us know in the comment section below what you think if you have some differing opinions on some of these mana value cards are aiming for maybe mid power or if you're a CDH player, maybe you can let us know how some stuff change at a CDH table as opposed to a mid power table. And that's it, everybody. Hope you enjoyed. And until next time, friends, see ya.